few years ago, a single study was published that ursodeoxycholic acid was used to treat someone with recurrent C. difficile, many episodes, with a spectacularly good effect. It cured the patient long term. Now, why did that happen? And it goes back to research that's been done not that long ago, maybe five, ten years ago it began, that while everyone knew that the occurrence of C. difficile infection was mostly related to having taken antibiotics. Why? What do antibiotics do to make you prone to get C. difficile? And it turns out that those individuals who developed antibiotics were walking around with C. difficile spores in their colon, but not bothering them. You can find those spores in the infants of newborn children. Those spores are, in a sense, dormant. Why do they suddenly become activated? And what's developed is that normally the liver makes bile acids that are excreted in the bile and go into your intestine with every meal. And they're called primary bile acids because they're made in the liver. But as those bile acids normally go through your intestines, and particularly when it gets into your colon, where you have billions of bacteria, they're converted, they're metabolized to what are called secondary bile acids. And lo and behold, the secondary bile acids have the normal function of keeping those spores in the dormant state. The major secondary bile acid that has that effect is deoxycholic acid. Certain antibiotics, they all to some extent, but some of them are notorious, will wipe out the normal bacteria that account for the conversion of the primary to secondary bile acids. So because of the antibiotics, you lose your secondary bile acids. And even worse, the primary bile acids stimulate the growth of those spores. So antibiotic-associated C. difficile occurs because you lose your normal gut microbiome that normally makes the secondary bile acids to keep them in a dormant state. It turns out that ursodeoxycholic acid, which is to a small extent normally in people's bile, but relatively little, is a surrogate for deoxycholic acid. It has the same effect as keeping those spores dormant. So when I read that paper, it seemed to me this would be a great medication to extend its therapeutic benefits from the diseases for which it's already been used to the treatment of C. difficile. So the URSA will bridge you over from the normal microbiome you had before you took the antibiotics to the normal microbiome you should get back after you stop taking the antibiotics. And the URSA acts as a bridge suppressing the spores so that you don't develop the inflammation. It was a single publication on a case study uh, and what's surprising is, and it's always been a surprise to me as long as I practice medicine, how long it takes for the word to get out. You can read something uh, that you said, oh, instantly it should go viral is the expression today. It's never gone viral. It will this uh, year, I think, because now a 16 patient study has been published 
showing that Urso is 93.7% effective for just that purpose. And eventually, when the word gets out, when it goes viral, it's going to become an important medication for the management of these problems. I'm not talking about cure or prevention or throw everything else away. It's an adjunct to every form of therapy. If you want to use FMT, give Ursa with it. If you want to use the new compounds that are developing, give Ursa. All you want to achieve is the patient never gets another episode. So this is what you could call adjunctive therapy. And because of the high safety profile, uh, the patient is at very little risk. In other words, with every medication, no matter what it is, you always have to speak with the patient and tell them what the risks are and tell them what the benefits are. And then the patient needs to decide if that benefit-risk ratio is worth taking. And with Urso, because the risk is so low, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily, a, it could only be 93% beneficial, that's pretty good. Uh, let me add an addendum. So relatively few patients that have been treated that we can't say overall how much is this going to impact the whole field. You have to treat thousands of patients before you can get reliable statistical data. But from a, uh, a logical point of view, it should be effective if, if you have taken an antibiotic and lowered your microbiome, but you have enough of it left to come back, then it should be effective. If your microbiome is out and you need a new microbiome, then it's not going to work. Yes, I would predict, and this is very speculative, I would predict that if you look 10 years down the road, if your physician says, well, you have pneumonia and I have to give you clindamycin, which has a 30% chance of causing C. diff, if you have those spores, he'll say, just to keep you from getting C. diff, I'm gonna give you a course of Urso with the antibiotic to try and bridge you over. Absolutely. The next step is to get out the word and get people to try it in clinical trials. I have tried, it, it's very, you see, it's at a disadvantage because it's, the drug has been out there so long and it's a generic drug, no drug company will sponsor a trial. They, uh, it's not proprietary. So it's very hard to get a funding agency to fund Urso studies uh, to see how effective it will be in a large population. The clinical implication is there'll be a lot less a primary occurrence of C. diff and it should be more effective in reducing the current episodes of C. diff. I'm sure uh, it's, it's a terrible problem and uh, just as antibiotics were a great advance, they created diseases uh, it'll turn out that Urso may not be effective in certain situations and uh, we have to define when uh, it'll be useful and when not.